this lunch seminar um, with uh, Professor John Whiteleg. It's a huge pleasure to have John with us today uh, talking about future mobility in the city. Uh, just to set the Swedish context for you, just two weeks ago the Swedish Prime Minister um, stood up at the UN General Assembly and said that Sweden would be one of the first countries in the world to go fossil free, with obviously great implications for the transport sector. And then I know that there's a new cycling budget being presented by the Stockholm city right now. So these are really hot topics in Sweden, but they're also hot topics around the world. Uh, as we know, you know, uh, the development of cities is going to be something that's going to be, uh, have a huge impact on sustainable development globally. So it's a great pleasure to welcome John um, to SEI. Over to you, John. Thank you. I will probably destroy the technology. I'll do my best. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It, it is a, a great pleasure to be here. I joined the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York in 2001, and some of the most genuinely exciting and interesting projects I've done in my career were with colleagues in York, in SEI. So it's a, and this has influenced the product you're going to see today. It's a very unusual presentation in the sense that um, for, or I don't like to try and remember the number of years, but for over 30 years I've m done research projects, made presentations, written books, produced articles, uh, advised national governments, advised cities, advised European Commission, the European Parliament, the British Parliament, the House of Commons Select Committee on Transport, on most, not all, most aspects of sustainable transport and all the time striving to bring about a transformation of mobility so that without damaging the um, quality of life or the need to carry out daily activities we shift the whole system away from something which I'll be talking about in the next 35-40 minutes, away from something which is carbon intensive, energy intensive, space intensive, and health damaging, ecologically damaging and so on, towards something which is actually uh, much more genuinely sustainable. In other words, a sustainable transformation. The really unusual part of my presentation today, which is at the core of what I'm about to say, is I think all that activity has not worked. I hesitate to say failed. I don't like the word failed. Uh, it has not worked. And uh, with SEI and with other projects I've been involved in, I've had the privilege of working in India, in China, uh, Africa south of the Sahara, most European countries, uh, constantly with the Australian government, especially on city transport in Australia. And everywhere the trend is getting worse. And you could summarise transport policy, including, and it's dangerous of me to say this, of course, including in Sweden, transport policy is to make things get worse, but more slowly than they might do otherwise. In other words, we are, we are, we are reinforcing the trend. So whenever you see a nice big road being built, or a new runway at an airport, or high-speed rail, uh, we're feeding the mobility monster, and we're doing it in a way that is actually unhelpful from a sustainable point of view. So the presentation is about what can we do differently? How can we change gear? How can we grasp the whole issue of paradigms, mindsets, political influence, uh, a new direction in terms of scientific analysis and so on, to basically transform mobility? And I hope to make some practical suggestions as well. And this is all now quite urgent. Not only have we got the, uh, the Swedish governmental example of a fossil fuel free economy, we've got the new approach, Sustainable Development Goals, where transportation and road safety is actually there. That was a major uh, achievement, and I suspect many in SEI were responsible for that, and we contributed. 11.2. Uh, 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 climate change, which I'll talk about in this presentation today. Possibly, again, I, I, I may be stretching my analysis too far, but on climate change, for example, um, my own work, SEI work in York, and other work around the world clearly points to the conclusion that our transportation carbon intensity and mobility trends have the potential to defeat the totality of all our climate change policies. We will fail miserably with anything to do with two degrees, anything to do with 80%, 100% reduction. We will fail totally because transport is booming. The mobility monster is getting larger and larger and larger and like all paradigms is unquestioned. So okay, let's see how we go. 
what is mobility? So again, I apologise, much of this will be very, very, very familiar to you. Did I do that? Oh dear, I've wrecked it already. <laughs> do I press something, Ian? Back. And now forward. Thank you. Um, a very two, three minute digression on mobility. I'm sure we all understand it, but I found when, when doing the kind of things I do in the European Parliament or the European Commission, um, the UK Department for Transport, House of Commons Select Committee, there is a fundamental lack of understanding that we're dealing with a long-term historical trend which is still growing. Uh, mobility can be measured in many different ways, but for all practical purposes, we're just interested in how many miles or kilometres we travel every year by all modes, right? and it's growing. Um, there are some fascinating scientific, analytical uh, implications behind this trend, which I'll mention far too briefly under the heading travel time constant, and then make the ra rather obvious point that it's a very deeply embedded paradigm. So if ever you suggest, as I've done, to the, uh, the political leaders of Manchester and Liverpool that we might just a little bit reduce car use, and um, we might head towards um, a, a, a percentage of all trips every day by bicycle that equals Berlin, uh, which is not all that, it's 15%, which is pretty good. London, with all its hype, is 2%, and we think we're wonderful in London, and we're not. If ever you suggest anything like that, the answers are all, no, 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 we can't do it, it will damage the economy. So, the trend, and I will deal with this far too quickly, but I hope the presentation can be shared in whatever way you like, you know, so you can all look at it in more detail later. There is a, a vast amount of analysis of this kind, and description, and prediction. And there's a whole other debate I don't have time to go into today around the title, Predict and Provide. Basically, mobility is a wonderful example of scientific fraud. What we do is predict the future level of mobility, you know this, I know you know it. We predict the future level of mobility, rail trips, air trips, uh, trips by car, we predict it, and then we say, oh dear, we need more roads, we need more runways, we need more things, we build them, and then we say, there you are, we were right, we did need them anyway, and those things generate the trips, they create the travel. And we can talk about that more later if you want. But this is a fairly standard analysis from a group of people, um, a, a, a global mobility study, uh, showing the, that you don't, I'm not going to talk about the numbers, the size of the pie chart, if you like, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, there's a structural shift uh, as we abandon slower modes and move towards faster modes. So again, back to Swedish and British transport policy. Uh, let's make things get worse, but more slowly. Let's maximise the amount of distance we travel every year. Let's spend as much as it costs to do so. And let's go faster as well as further. And that summarises Swedish and British transport policy. If, ever you, if any of you wrote those documents, tell me. And uh, I will apologise and see you behind the bike shed afterwards. Okay. Um, again, lots of diagrams like this linking the growth in passenger kilometres travelled uh, per capita to uh, growth in, in basically in GDP per capita. Now, like you, I guess, I don't like GDP, it's severely flawed, but most of transport analysis, most of economic modelling, most of transport prediction is based upon GDP and comparing GDP around the world. And basically any diagram showing mobility trends of that kind will show something like this. And you can even get into the regional, you could disaggregate global trends by region. So we have a very fast growing phenomenon. The, the trend is to travel further and faster and that is replicated in all regions of the world. At the same time as, as the as income goes up, uh, we get the, um, and as the passenger kilometres travelled per capita goes up, we get a decline in public transport. This vertical scale share of public transport modes in passenger kilometres travelled. Here is a bigger ideology. 
that is at the root of the mobility ideology, if you like, that, uh, that public transport in collective things become rap rapidly become associated with socialism and other nasty words with ism on the end and the promotion of individual modes of transport especially the car and higher and uh, higher speed modes of transport becomes the norm in all our so-called advanced industrial societies I wanted to point out uh, um, a scientific flaw in the whole uh, mobility transport economic analysis economic evaluation, cost-benefit analysis area. Um, I'd be very interested afterwards in questions and, and discussion whether uh, this has been discussed in Sweden. But this goes back to uh, the work of a person called Marchetti at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna who has been plodding all, is it in the DNA, is it to do with Darwinian evolution, survival of the species, what is it? And I'm not so interested in what is it, but it's 1.1 hour a day. And Marchetti's work, I've written about this in terms of the benefits of that project. So anything to do with the costs of that project, carbon emissions, dead bodies, uh, people in hospital for air pollution, are swamped because the benefits are hugely in excess of the cost. But what Marchetti's work shows, and uh, someone called David Metz has repeated it in London, and I've written about it in my, in my recent book, uh, what this analysis shows that we never do save time. It's really important to grasp this, because this is, I think, I may be wrong, I think this is a scientific fraud. Um, we never do save time, we consume time-saving benefits as extra distance. So the result of all our massive elaborate cost-benefit analysis and transport infrastructure spending simply encourages us, encourages us to travel bigger distances. So each year we travel further to do our shopping, further to take the kids to school, for everything increases. And the, you know, and you know this, if ever you want to frighten yourselves, look at Atlanta and Houston in the States and then look at somewhere like a, somewhere in Berlin or somewhere in a, a nice Swedish city and, and look at the population density and look at energy per capita, transport distance travel per capita and it's an enormous difference and we're heading more and more and more towards the lower density, the bigger distances and this, we know this is the case, we know that building transport infrastructure uh, generates extra distance, we know it shifts us dramatically into more and more uh, unsustainability and yet we do it and I've yet to find a traffic engineer or a policy making outfit in a city council or in a national government who says, ah, but uh, I don't know whether we should have 12 lanes of motorway between Darmstadt and Frankfurt. I'm not so sure that's a good idea because have you read Marchetti's travel time constant? Do you know what impact it will have? And that it, it's, it's the definition of a paradigm because you're not even allowed to ask the question. And I dare say we will come back to that. So, mobility is increasing, we have a very, very, very um, intensive trend, and this is uh, around the world. But is it a problem? Now, you will know the arguments, because I hear them all the time in Britain, that higher levels of mobility, greater levels of car use, uh, improves the quality of life, gives access to many things, uh, creates a, an extremely satisfying and uh, enjoyable lifestyle. But what we don't do in transport enough is actually audit audit the consequences and again far too far too short uh, a, a checklist for me today so we know that higher levels of mobility bring death and injury in road crashes and lots of problems from air pollution we know this uh, I've produced a sustainable transport plan for Calcutta in India and we gave up trying to count the number of dead bodies it's over a thousand pedestrians killed every year and the city of Calcutta and the state of West Bengal are building flyovers. Uh, the Japanese are giving them money to build flyovers called International Development Aid, um, uh, JICA. Um, and the whole trend in an Indian city is towards high levels of mobility and increasing levels of death and injury. It's enormously expensive. We have a discussion in Britain. We're told that uh, we have to reduce the deficit and we're in an age of austerity. We can't pay for education, we can't pay for healthcare, but you can spend any amount of money on roads and high speed rail. It's, it's dead easy. All you've got to say is it's modern and it's efficient. It, I'll say a little bit about social interaction and community life, the hidden dimension of transport policy and mobility. 
damages all the people and it takes up too much space. <clears throat> so this is just a quick audit of the things associated with mobility and the things that actually do get worse as mobility goes up and the things that are never taken into account as a reason for transforming the nature of mobility to produce a different paradigm. We can manage at lower levels of mobility but a paradigm always uh, rejects the possibility of asking questions. Okay, the, the numbers are I think um, not too important. Every day 3,200 people are killed on the world's roads. Um, I, I work with the World Health Organization in Geneva training uh, the road safety leaders of African countries and it's a very very difficult task to try and shift mindsets and thinking in, in Zambia, Zimbabwe and Mozambique about deaths which are increasing rapidly. So 1.2 million a year 85% of these deaths are in lower middle income countries, 96% of the child deaths in road crashes are in lower middle income countries. I don't know if like, as in Britain, uh, uh, there's a debate in Sweden, we ban the use of the word accident. It is not allowed to use the word accident. There is no such thing as a road traffic accident. And uh, this is the, the official position of the World Health Organization the official position of the British Medical Journal and it's something I've argued about for years because every fatality in the road traffic environment is predictable and preventable. That does not correspond with the word accident and it's very important because paradigms are associated with language. So no such thing as an accident, so there are deaths and serious injuries in the road traffic environment and we know how to eliminate them and in fact Sweden is quoted all over the world because of Vision Zero and this is one of the projects I did in York on the Swedish Vision Zero project. Okay, disabilities and uh, large numbers of people especially in Africa and India severely disabled for, for the rest of their lives as a result of uh, a, a crash, a road traffic crash and very high costs. If, if we believe the economic analysis around the value of a human life and that's tricky as well. The audit information, the data goes on and on and on. Uh, a couple of slides from this, this report. Uh, the global burden of disease from motorised road transport from uh, a number of prestigious organisations, World Bank, University of Washington and so on. And it just puts things in, a, in an interesting context. When we're talking about mobility, we have to be aware of the negative, the, the disbenefits, the associations with mobility. So um, I'm not going to read out the numbers. It's interesting, from again, from an ideological or paradigmatic point of view, that you don't get the same kind of discussion around road safety as you do about HIV. The deaths and injuries in road crashes exceeds HIV, it exceeds many well-known cancers and quite rightly HIV and cancers require that amount of attention. But road safety does not grasp the imagination, partly because of the word accident. Over the last decades, uh, road deaths increased by 46%. This is another aspect of mobility. That's a huge increase and that increase the various organizations like the World Health Organization are predicting a doubling and a trebling of deaths in the road traffic environment. Um, uh, an interesting little another scientific point really if you use official data it's wrong. Uh, road deaths in Africa are underreported by a factor of six. In China, they're underreported by a factor of four. We don't know what it is in India. And that's based on detailed research where you go around hospitals and do counting, and then you look at the official data, and that's the disparity. Um, I said I would mention social <coughs> and community interaction type things. Um, I, I really do think this is an important dimension of mobility, which is uh, totally uh, airbrushed out of the system. Um, I've yet to find in my travels a city administration or a national government or any other agency that takes into account this kind of information. This is from a piece of, a, of German research some years ago and in Germany it was called How Fast Can Your Grandmother Run? Um, and what they did in Germany is go around several cities and you, with a stopwatch looking at the green light for pedestrians you press a button, you get a green light after a little wait, I just did that walking here from Central Station there were lots of places where I had to stand around twiddling my thumbs waiting for a green light 
and as you measure the width of the road, okay, and then you work out the speed, and when you get to somewhere like Kassel in, in Germany, grandmas really do have to be athletic, and they have to run very fast, whereas life is a bit better in Hamburg, uh, in fact, quite a lot better. Uh, the, it, it A lot of really good British research. My colleague in SEI in York, Gary Hatch, is, is focusing on uh, uh, transport and the elderly, which is really interesting as a subject. <clears throat> and the elderly are, are, are increasingly isolated. They, don't, they can't cross roads. They're fearful. Um, if they're isolated and they like friends and contacts, then uh, there's medical research showing that the immune system is damaged and become ill and so on. So we have to identify the social consequences of mobility. So high levels of mobility are, let us assume, great for those groups in society that can jump in a car or an aircraft or high-speed train and run around a great deal. Uh, if you're an elderly person with a health problem, it's pretty dire. If you're a child um, uh, and you want to wander around your neighbourhood, um, maybe walking and cycling and seeing your friends is pretty dire because in Britain, very well researched in Britain, children's independent mobility. We have exterminated the biological option of allowing children to grow and develop in their communities by walking and cycling. We got rid of it because it's too dangerous. And those social consequences are really important. I think many of you will have seen the famous Donald Appleyard research in San Francisco many years ago. Uh, one of my students uh, repeated this in Bristol in a British city. We can summarize all that quite easily. Basically, the, the, the top diagram there is a lightly trafficked street. So you count the number of vehicles. Right? And the bottom diagram there is a heavily trafficked street. And if you look at all the black lines, which always remind me of slug trails in my garden, if you look at the black lines, um, what you're looking at, this is actual measurements of what people do. And they are uh, going onto the street, crossing the road, talking to neighbours, hanging about, uh, having a nice time, using the space as a social resource, right? Uh, once you get higher levels of traffic, the social resource is exterminated. People do not know their neighbours, they do not associate randomly or accidentally with uh, other people, they don't cross the road very much, and that has a direct impact on how people report their worries and their doubts and their fears about uh, living in their particular community. Again, I, I, I challenge traffic engineers in Britain to show me one example where this kind of diagram has been fed into a decision about uh, traffic planning about a transport plan for Manchester or Liverpool or York or whatever and never has it been used. It is not used and it's not used because it is paradigmatically unacceptable. It, it, it challenges the existing paradigm and again the core element of what I'm trying to say today is to, is to identify that there is a paradigm that we're not allowed to question it and that there's a need to shift the paradigm. This is really important research and it needs to be taken into account. So for example, we could take this into account and, and this is where politicians in Britain, uh, on one occasion I was giving a presentation and two of them ran out of the room shouting rubbish and slammed the door as they left, so you might like to take advantage of that suggestion yourself. Um, we can use this research and we can close streets. We shut them down, right? We say no more traffic. And the research we've done in Britain, some excellent research called Disappearing Traffic, shows that Western civilization does not collapse, the world does not come to an end, uh, the economy does not collapse, there are no negative consequences, and several hundred people have a happy, healthy, socially interacting, child-friendly, elderly-friendly life. But at the moment, the majority opinion is to encourage traffic, and traffic means cars. Okay, so we can close down roads, we can shut roads. I was very pleased recently to see diagrams in Seoul in Korea where they've demolished a large road and replaced it with a park. Uh, they're doing it in Vancouver, demolishing a large road 
and replacing it with green space and trees. I'm working very hard with colleagues in Liverpool and Manchester to demolish two large roads. They are motorways. Remove them, throw them away, shut them down. Who says we need more road space? It's the mobility paradigm that says we need road space. And no matter how wonderful Sweden is, and I quote Sweden a lot as being wonderful, you build too many new roads and you widen roads and you feed the mobility monster with endless amounts of money because somebody somewhere thinks building roads is a really good idea. And it isn't. Okay. Uh, space. Uh, again, we all know, you've probably seen this diagram, it's very famous, it makes a nice poster. Uh, many students have it on their wall, but it's another example of the dominance of the mobility paradigm does not allow us to have a transport policy in Stockholm that says, this is pretty dumb, right? In other words, if you want to move 10,000 people around every day, and the British figure is the average car occupancy is 1.2, uh, I'm not sure what 0.2 of a person looks like, but uh, okay. So you need a lot of space if you're going to move 10,000 people around in cars. If you move that number of people around in a bus, you need that much space. And if you move them with bicycles, you need that much. That looks like a lot of space compared to a bus, but that's a lot better than that. So we know, it's, again, it's, it, it, it's another aspect of how paradigms shift uh, prioritisation and budgets and spending and planning into a, a, a sort of non-logical, uh, non-intellectual area. So we know all this, for example. This is masses of research. My training is a rather traditional 1960s geographer. Geographers are obsessed with space and time, always. And in fact, uh, when I was a 1960s geographer, I spent all my time reading Torsten Hegerstrand at the University of Lund, who was very famous and he was our hero. I don't know what happened to all that work. It was really exciting. However, we still look at space. So if you're a pedestrian, uh, you, and, and this varies by speed, you need more space to move around the faster you go. Okay? Uh, then the pedestrian, at an average pedestrian speed, uses 0.8 square meters per person. So it's incredibly efficient and cost effective and healthy to move as many people as possible around on foot. And the bicycle also comes in very well. But if you go for the car with one person, which we do in Britain, because we have policies that say we will have thousands and thousands and thousands of car parking places in our cities. And we never carry out uh, a basic exercise and say, well, how many do we need? How many match our modal split aspirations? So this uh, character here, moving around at this speed, needs, is it, I need my glasses, is it 60? Yeah, yeah 60 square meters per person. So if you compare a pedestrian with someone in a car, the, the gulf is enormous, it is dramatic. So we can plan our cities on the basis of a, a much more uh, efficient allocation of space. We can reduce car parking, we can reduce highway capacity, we can have parks, we can have trees, we can have whatever we want, but we allocate space in an extremely inefficient manner in a place where space is incredibly valuable. If you wanted to buy uh, a couple of hectares of space somewhere in Stockholm, it would be really, really, really expensive. So why do we allocate so much space so expensively to people travelling around in cars? In my career of doing transport projects, I had one major success. I persuaded Heathrow Airport, I was doing a travel plan, I'll say a little bit about that later, for Heathrow Airport and we were getting nowhere at all in the debate and I was saying you have to reduce the amount of car parking uh, it's really important they said no 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 we need to encourage people to come by car to Heathrow Airport and I said well have you looked at your car park in terms of a, an asset a real estate asset and, and the people I worked with the managing agency for Heathrow Airport said oh interesting point I said well let's look at this car park here and he said oh right so uh, if we if we develop the buses and the underground and the uh, the special train like your Orlando Express if we develop all those things we will need less car parking is that correct I said yes and then we don't need that car park do we which has 750 car parking spaces on it I said no you don't and he said that ah, I can sell that space for five million pounds to someone who wants to expand a hotel. So when you start to get that different way of looking at something, that car parking is a suboptimal, uh, inefficient, economically uh, wasteful use of resources, you begin to make progress. 
Okay. All this is leading me, and I really do need to know, I need your help, what you think about this. Thank you. He's telling me to shut up. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ian. Uh, towards paradigm shift. We need to shift the whole mindset, the whole mentality. And I'm suggesting a very specific way of doing this. A very specific way, because in my own work uh, with focus groups and citizen juries and public engagement, I have taken careful note that it, it attracts support. People are willing to move in the direction of the Swedish Vision Zero, zero death and serious injury, um, and they're willing to move in the direction of uh, eliminating air pollution. So I've done work in London with focus groups and citizen juries, and they're appalled. In London, 4,000 people die every year because of poor air quality, 95% of which comes from traffic, okay? Independently of Volkswagen's attempts to make it worse. Um, and they like the idea. They like the idea of zero carbon. And all these things working together give us maximum synergistic gain. Right, paradigm shift. This takes a lot of time to explain, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, basically, uh, paradigms do shift and do change, and you do end up going through at least three phases. And I think we're already showing signs of being in the destabilization and disorientation phase. The mobility paradigm is unraveling. Right? Uh, the whole of transport economics is unraveling. Again, each one of these is worthy of a discussion in its own right. But after years of buying into normal economics, normal transport economics, we now know that new highway infrastructure does not bring economic gains, it does not create jobs, does not increase GDP. We know that new roads generate new traffic, does, they do not solve congestion, and so on and so on. We know that sustainable transport actions bring massive economic benefits, and that, that has been ignored, deliberately ignored in the past. This is a new European Commission project that I was involved in as a, 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 an expert reviewer or something they called it. Uh, this was launched last week. Uh, the yellow doesn't work very well, I apologise for that. The whole project is called the EU Evidence Project and it is a detailed catalogue of global evidence showing that if you do the sustainable things, and that's walking, cycling, public transport, uh, demand management, all the things that we know about in, in sustainable transport, they are economically, in traditional economic ways, high performers. They do better than the, the non-sustainable uh, options. This is backed up by, uh, again, I'm not going to show you all of these, let me just show you one of them. Um, yeah, this one. Um, backed up by a lot of research that again has been airbrushed quietly out of the picture. Paradigms exterminate non-conforming evidence. So this is from UITP, the Brussels-based global public transport organisation. All you need to fix on there is that as the proportion of trips made on foot, bicycle and public transport goes up, so the cost of transport goes down. So it's like saying to the city of Stockholm, do you want to spend X billion, whatever, Swedish krona or whatever, on running the total transport system, or would you like to spend half of X? Which do you prefer? And you can have a totally functioning, efficient transport system which costs less and is carbon reduced. And if you want to know how to reduce carbon, there's a wonderful report uh, from the Stockholm Environment Institute in the University of York. This took us about three years to sort out uh, uh, with my, uh, all that, that group you see on the bottom there. So that obviously is on the SEI website. And we showed in this report, British, it's all UK data, that it is possible to totally decarbonise land transport and get rid of about half of aviation's carbon and half of shipping's carbon. And it's on the website, so you can go and look at it yourself. I'm not going to talk about the methodology even though it, obs it, it was my life's obsession for three years. Um, and we had a business as usual scenario in the baseline year, then we took business as usual to 2050, and that's what we ended up with, having produced a detailed analysis of all the interventions. So this is the practicality. What do we do on a Monday morning? What do we actually do? We have to talk about the reality in Stockholm or London or, or Europe or wherever, and we can reduce carbon. Uh, the numbers, um, the key thing about reducing carbon is synergy. 
So we have to do the spatial, the fiscal, the behavioural, the technological, the organisational, and this, in a sense, is, is a kind of a hybrid thing of all the ones ab above there, but we have to sort out budgets to make those things more important. We have to do workplace travel plans. I'm very proud of this. This is from the British Standardisation Institute. It is the world's first guide to travel plans, and uh, they asked me to write it, and it was funded by Transport for London. This tells anybody, including the Stockholm Environment Institute in Stockholm, how you can get rid of anybody who's coming by car every day. I'm sure you don't here anyway. Uh, yeah, you're a very noble lot, um, and everyone can use bicycles and buses and so on. Okay, we're not there yet, we're still in trouble. Uh, there are big obstacles. So what I'm saying we need to do, paradigm shift, paradigm change, we, we've got to do a lot more to do it, and I think we can do it, but we've got to start by identifying the big obstacles. Subsidy, prices, don't tell the ecological truth, famous quote from Mr. Weizsäcker in Wuppertal, and our whole best, well, cost-benefit analysis and appraisal, I've explained that, is based on invalid assumptions. Whenever I go to a meeting in Brussels, I always have this picture with me, uh, because I think it's very helpful to think in terms of elephants. So we have Pachyderm 1 and Pachyderm 2, right? Uh, Pachyderm 1, so you have a big discussion about, oh, you know, sustainable transport, fifth environmental action programme, sixth environmental, all the stuff we talk about in the European Commission. Nobody is prepared to recognise that the whole system is driven by 270 billion euros a year of transport subsidy. So the European Commission is primarily organised around upping that number. So we throw 270 billion euros of sub direct subsidy, cash transfers, that's not externalities, and that is an even bigger elephant than I've managed to show there. It's an enormous elephant. And then people talk about the growth in demand for transport and how we must change it. So this is it, we're nearly over, Ian, finished. Um, there are two options for the future. Uh, we can have an expensive health damaging, carbon generating, ecologically damaging infrastructure fetish system. That's Stockholm and London and most other cities. Or we can go for lower cost, health promoting, carbon reducing, ecologically responsible mobility re-engineering. Um, we can go for Mumbai or we can go, I should really have shown somewhere, that I, was, I was giving lectures in Lund last week and I thought I should really show Lund because it looks very pretty in the middle of Lund anyway. Okay, and of course, I don't want you to buy it because I've just told you what's in it, uh, but this, it, it took me a long time to write this book, um, and it's available, and everything I've talked about today, with lots and lots and lots of references, because I know in Stockholm Environment Institute you have to have lots of references, uh, there's lots of references, and you can follow up everything I've said today in this exciting new book. Thank you very much. very much John, um, that was very stimulating um, and I hope that um, we've got some uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, the mic. Sorry, Oh sorry, uh, sorry. yes yeah, and we'll just sort of exchange it around the room. Right, yes, no, thank you very much, John. Um, that was very stimulating, I hope prov provoking as well for people. Um, we're going to open it up for, for questions um, uh, from the floor. I, I had one Im immediate one, perhaps to, to get things kicked off. Um, you, you, um, you talk about the sort of infrastructure, if you build it, they will come. Um, what alternative types of infrastructure would lead to your, to your Amsterdam, your Lund? Uh, uh, well, what do we need to do on the Monday morning in that yeah. case? Yeah. I, I think, first of all, what we have to do is just go back a step to look at structure and space, spatial structure um, and subsidy. So, first of all, if we, get, if we get the subsidy thing sorted out and the spatial structure thing sorted out, a colleague of mine in Germany, Helmut Holzapfel, runs a project funded by the federal German government called Creating the City of Short Distances. So, fundamentally, we have to intervene, first of all, so that things are nearer and there are more things. There are ways we can do this. We can do it with healthcare, we can do it with um, schools, we can do it with a whole number of things that people travel for. Um, if we get that right, then the current infrastructure is going to be more in harmony with and in tune with the demands to be made of it. So it, it's almost like the old Irish joke when you ask for directions and someone says, if I was you, I wouldn't start from here. You know, it, it, it's going back a little bit and starting from the structure. In terms of infrastructure, 
infrastructure then, there is a, a real need. Um, when I've done projects in India and China, for example, I've recommended, and this goes nowhere at all because state governments and city governments are not interested, I've recommended a total pedestrian infrastructure where every highway and every road uh, in every city in India and China and between has a 2.5 metre wide segregated pedestrian path. Now, I've no idea what that would cost, by the way, but I do have an idea what motorways cost and high-speed rail costs and so on. Uh, because one of the main problems, I, I know Indian cities better than Chinese cities, and one of the main problems with road safety and with people moving around is that there is no pedestrian infrastructure at all. Not even an ability to cross the road. And so the infrastructure then would include crossing facilities, which would just be a raised big hump of some kind. So there is a need for infrastructure. So I suppose uh, what I'm really advocating is, is abandoning the expansion of motorised transport and carbon generating transport until the system has settled down a bit more by doing the spatial planning and by doing that kind of non motorised transport infrastructure. Thanks very much, John. I can already see there's a hand over there. Um, if, you, if you want to ask a question, please say who you are and where you're from. Hi, th my name is Aaron Etheridge. I'm with SCI here in Stockholm. So thanks very much for a really interesting presentation, and I liked a lot of the analysis of you know, the use of time and space. Really good. I'm just wondering, how, how much of your argument is really about mobility versus mode? Because at the beginning you talked about um, the mobility paradigm, and, and I, I, I was expecting almost that you'd end up by having us question the concept of how much we should actually move and how much we should move around. But it seemed like a lot of your emphasis was actually on switching away from cars to other means of transport. So how much of it is mobility and how much mode? <clears throat> Again, the, a bit like the last question, the first point I would want to make is reduce the need to travel. So that fundamentally, you're not even at the, the modal bit yet. You know, we have to reduce the need to travel. The, uh, the 1.1 hour travel time constant would also imply that we should have enough things within that kind of walking radius, or certainly cycling radius, so as to make the, uh, the non-motorised modes uh, perfectly suited. To, to living a high quality of life, especially in an urban area. There's a separate discussion, by the way, about rural areas, which I'm also involved with. And then in terms of your, your, your main point about modal transfer, the, the, our carbon, our decarbonisation study in, in SEI in York was very much concerned with first level one, reduce the need to travel, level two, uh, reduce the amount of car travel, and level three, increase the amount of walking, cycling and public transport. So uh, the, the, modal, uh, the modal transfer thing is important, but it's actually a problem with current sustainable transport, um, what shall we call it, discourse, is that most of it doesn't even do with the different, it doesn't deal with the different levels. It takes, it takes a, a particular context and says, right, um, if I improve this bus route, or if I build uh, an urban railway, or if I build an underground metro, then I will switch. Or usually if I build a tram, you know, I can, I can get to maybe one third of the car drivers to switch. Uh, we took the view that that's not the correct approach. The correct approach is to reduce the need to travel, to, to develop the alternatives so that they are very attractive. But that, that requires this, this spatial dimension that I keep talking about. The city of short distances, high quality accessibility. And that's, as I, as I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's missing everywhere. Uh, I, in Lund last week I asked people about this and we had people from the municipalities of Lund and Malmo um, and they said yes it is missing in those cities even though lots of good things are happening you know, with cycling and with public transport and other things so my, my answer is that there, there is a, a slight amount of confusion in, in the way I argue these things but if we get that three level thing right I think everything follows from, from that and it would work out more sustainable than the current Thanks. I'm going to rush over here. Henrik, do, do I need to use this? Yes, in this please. Moment? Okay, I'm Henrik Carlsson, uh, SCI Stockholm. Uh, first a comment, then a question. Uh, it seems to me that Sweden has a good reputation with regards to transport. But when I, when I look at Stockholm and Gothenburg, for example, they are close to Atlanta with regards to urban sprawl. The number of people per square meter in Stockholm is uh, roughly the same as Atlanta. 
And what people, t when people talk about Stockholm in daily life, the area, what we mean with Stockholm, is roughly the same as London. Right. 1.5 million people, yeah. and in London, 12 million people in the same area. So, so f this is, I have a big question mark in, in my head. Why is this in Sweden? Same in Gothenburg. Malmö is a little bit more dense. Uh, this brings me over to the other question. Uh, what I think is the real monster you need to fight is the car industry. Okay. Because in Europe, uh, the overarching policy goal, everything that has happened in the European Union, is job creation. Yeah. And the car industry is one of the very few areas w in which I think European policymakers think that here we have a chance to fight the Chinese, the Japanese and the American. The car industry is really, really strong. Um, it seems to me that it's not included in your analysis so far. Thanks, Henrik. No, right. I might take a couple of others, if that's all right, John, if you can keep those in your hand. Yeah, um, I'm going to brush past you, actually, because Tim had his hand up first. Thanks. Uh, Tim Suliata, also SEI Stockholm. Um, I was interested in how freight comes into the equation, movement of goods uh, um, around, um, because I think when you talked about uh, that uh, the economic analysis focuses on time savings and that's gobbled up by uh, extra distance that people travel. In the case of freight it would probably be more density in, in terms of uh, passage of goods um, and to me it seems like it, it, it could make more economic sense but then again when you look at uh, the political discussion and the reason behind the building of infrastructure Mostly it appeals to uh, people personally and that they want to drive, they want to be able to get somewhere quicker. So I just wondered uh, if, uh, you know, do, in your opinion, does uh, freight make sense and, and how does that come into the, the cost-benefit analysis? Um, and is that even uh, a real consideration when, when people talk about building infrastructure? Thanks. I'm going to rush it over to you now, John. I, I've seen other hands going up. I've, I've noticed that. So, yeah, something to do with, you know, the, the policy incoherence, if you like, yep. about, you know, wanting to stimulate jobs and therefore the car industry having a, having a, a special interest in policymakers' minds while at the same time having air pollution targets and wanting to build sustainable cities. That's, I think, sort of a way of interpreting your, your question. Um, and then, then freight. And freight. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you. Um, the, your first point about the, um, what shall we call it, the low density of population in Greater Stockholm I did not know um, and that clearly is is an element of non-sustainability it's quite all those funny graphs which I spared you uh, a lot of them deal with density and energy consumption per capita for example so the evidence is overwhelming that if you're at those lower levels of density you're in trouble and that's part of the mobility paradigm because we're not going to be able to produce the reductions we need in carbon emissions with the transport sector if our density remains at the kind of levels you're talking about. So something has to change. Um, and there are ways, I mean, again, in this presentation, I'd love to talk in much more detail. There are ways of intervening to alter the density. I've worked with Australian cities, which are really very, very, uh, very much in trouble in terms of low density, uh, to, to create new nodes of high accessibility and new developments around railway stations. But that's another story. So there are practical ways to intervene, right? The car industry, yes, uh, and uh, my hope is that somebody else picks that one up. You know, I, I am trying to be a mixture of a geographer and a transport scientist, uh, but part of me wants to go out and campaign against the car industry. Uh, uh, but I feel that I've got to leave that to somebody else. I, uh, the, I didn't say enough about this evidence project that I flashed up on a couple of slides, but the, the actual, and it goes back to what you were just saying, the actual economics is, is the reverse of what he said. If you, if, if you carry out an economic analysis, of, uh, because the Chinese have done this, you know, for every car they make, they claim to create, a, there's an equation, uh, so many jobs for every car they make, and that's quite a powerful sort of um, uh, uh, rhetoric or powerful argument. But you can make the same points about high accessible cities and investing in walking, cycling and public transport. And the evidence project brings that together. It shows that actual job creation is higher. If you, and, and it's higher in terms, this is crucial, in terms of local geographies localities. So yeah, a lot of money goes into the motor vehicle manufacturing sector of the economy and lots of jobs are jobs in Lund and Malmo and Stockholm and all these other places. You have to invest in the sustainable transport, otherwise the money's draining away. 
is trading away to Eastern Europe or to Taiwan or wherever. You know, it's, in a, it's like a globalised system for siphoning off the cash, the economic gains. Uh, but we could talk about more, about more about that later. We do need something that, that brings this more into the forefront of the public imagination. Now, on freight, I, I, I am once again guilty. Uh, if you go to a chapter in there, it's all about freight, right? Uh, there is such a thing as uh, sustainable freight transport. Uh, I did a report on that for Greenpeace, uh, European Greenpeace, some years ago. And it's all about taking the same kind of approach I've adopted for passenger transport and applying it to Rate. So first of all, reduce the demand. Uh, and here I've worked with Helmut Holtzapfel in Germany, who's produced an analysis of regionalised freight. So at the moment, you know, I was saying rude things about um, Swedish and British transport policy, where we encourage people to travel as far as possible, uh, as fast as possible, as often as possible. Well, we do that with freight. Right. So what you can have is a regionalised freight model uh, whereby uh, systems are set up for encouraging uh, those that consume whatever's in the back of a lorry to swap distant sources for near sources to carry out a different kind of urban logistics where you actually intercept large vehicles on the edge of cities, for example, to use more coastal shipping, to use more... So everything about modal shift and everything about reducing the demand is there in the context of freight. And uh, in, in Germany, there's some very interesting, if I can remember the German for it, Lastkraft Mount Wagen, I think it is, or Lastkraft Wagen Mount, I'm not sure. Anyway, there's a tax on lorries, right? A, a weight distance tax. And that's produced a rejigging of the spatial economy. Uh, still being monitored. So there is such a thing as sustainable freight. It's more challenging because when you get into the uh, global trade flows and, and you get into the large container ships coming to Britain from China uh, with everything we need for Christmas and, and, and there's, you know, well, we don't really know. Uh, I, I have not yet worked out a way of dismantling globalisation. Uh, I think there will be a way of dismantling globalisation, but I'm, I'm focusing on some of the easier things first of all. So yeah, everything I've said about passenger transport applies to freight as well, and it's in there. And aviation, and shipping, it's all there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Thank you. John. Um, I think I saw Ulla's hand going up. <laughs> Anybody else? And Ellie as well. Okay, I'll start with you, Ulla. And I've got a couple of questions um, from online as well. Uh, Ulla Olsson also here at uh, CI Stockholm. Uh, I'm wondering what, in what way is there a conflict between city planning and the apparent benefits of choice from living in a city? You know, you can plan to have a hairdresser and a, and a grocery shop and one place, but I don't like that, so I'm not going to go there, even though it's the closest one. You see what I mean? Um, Hold on, John, I'm going to bring Ellie in as well. Hi, yeah, Ellie Dawkins, also from SEI. Um, I was just wondering, is there any evidence of the economic models changing at all, or are they staying uh, <laughs> as they are? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, let me uh, think about the more difficult one first whilst I answer you, OK? Um, not much evidence of change. In that UK, sorry, the European Commission evidence project, we had discussions about, specifically about, benefit cost analysis and the value of time and whether or not it is possible to bring in for all the health uh, implications of mobility. So for, uh, I haven't talked much about that at all because it's much bigger than road safety. So the number of people hospitalised as a result of um, poor air quality for example. And the, the national government in Britain is very resistant, does not want to change because we have a whole system of economic appraisal and economic project evaluation evaluation and benefit cost analysis for transport projects. Uh, the government admit that it is biased against sustainable transport, biased against non-motorised transport. So it actually punishes projects, for example public transport projects get a big negative um, monetary, they get a cost associated with them because they take people away from cars and the government loses revenue from fuel taxation. So a public transport project has, uh, has a tough, it can't survive, you know, it has a tough time. And, and there's no willingness uh, on the part of government to change that, which takes me back to my ideas about changing mindsets and changing paradigms. So the evidence project 
points to much better ways of doing this. And in fact, cycling has already made quite a lot of progress. There are specific economic analysis tools for cycling about the economic benefits associated with higher levels of cycling in urban areas in Europe. So in the, whatever we call it, on the fringe, you know, in the NGOs and in sustainable transport, there are real practical suggestions for changes, but government, well, British government, is, just won't change. May I explore your point a bit more? Um, I, what I took from what you said is, is that in terms of city planning, uh, I'm arguing for a higher level of what I would call um, destination rich, more things that you can go to within a shorter, a smaller geographical area. And, and in the British context, I don't know enough about the Swedish planning context, we can work towards that through the planning system we can have city planning that, for example, encourages, because the big Britain is still locked into a strange ideology that says retailing is there, housing is there, other jobs are there. So we like to maximise distances. And the way we're trying to do this density enrichment, as I would call it, is to change the planning rules to allow things to be co-located. Right, so, so, that, that, so it's changing a regulatory regime. It doesn't in any way involve any element of compulsion or any element of the denial of choice. Though when you get into the choice, this is why I was confused uh, about part of what you said, um, the whole thing about the current paradigm is it deprives me of choice. Uh, the British transport planning system and governmental funding system for transport assumes that the car is the default option for all journeys. So I am deprived of choice. I don't want to use a car. I want to cycle. I want to walk. I want to use public transport. My daughter's just moved to a, an English village, which is incredibly beautiful. And uh, when I checked how to get there by bus, it says there's a bus every other Tuesday. <laughs> and I, I'm still in a state of shock. Uh, uh, it's, it's usually bad, but that's especially bad. So what that tells me, there's a message there that everyone in that village owns a car and the expectation on everyone's part is that they will use the car. So that's where the lack of choice is. But have I misunderstood what, what you were saying? Yeah. No, I think you were exactly on, on my on my way of thinking. And I was just, I guess it's a reflection of the way that the car is, is like um, attached with all these uh, illusions of choice and flexibility, whereas in reality there's pretty much the opposite yeah. of the case. Thanks very much. Anybody else in the room with a question? I've got a couple actually on, online, if that's all right, John. Um, one is, is a, a question around whether there are cultural factors at play in determining mobility or choices about which modes of transport are used. That's one. And the second is, is um, whether you had examples of um, international development aid that instead of ended up building mega infrastructure and highways and that sort of thing, we're actually aiming for a more sustainable uh, yeah, okay. uh, infrastructure. Um, on on the, um, the the second point, the, the development aid, that was your point, wasn't it? Um, there are examples of projects funded by development agencies and by the World Bank and by the relevant bits of the European Union that claim to be sustainable transport, but it's still aimed at things like uh, a metro, you know, like an underground system or a tram system and so on. Um, what I'm not aware of, and I, I will be delighted if it did exist, is projects, for example, my, my point earlier about the pedestrian uh, infrastructure to, to give every Indian city, every Indian resident a high quality pedestrian pavement segregated from traffic. And I'm not aware of anything like that, which is what I'm looking for. And the first point, because I've forgotten already. Cultural. Oh, yes. Mm. Uh, I'm very wary of the word cultural, uh, because anywhere in the world, uh, so uh, in my non-sustainable lifestyle, I've worked extensively in Australia, and I haven't worked out a way to get there sustainably. Um, so in an Australian city, the first thing you're told always is, look you, this is Australia, right, not Britain. And we like vast spaces, and we like to travel long distances, and, and we 
we want a house by itself surrounded by gardens with a swimming pool with a garage for three cars and parking for an additional five cars and this has been told to me many times in all Australian cities and working and I said okay well, well let's just talk about that a little bit more and then we the relevant cities have done projects and the Australians are just as good as anybody else in the world for changing that so when you start to so for example Subiaco which is a suburb of Perth in Western Australia, the world's remotest city in Perth. And, and that's a new railway station and a new bus station and a new shopping centre and thousands of new apartments all in a very small area. And Australians have flooded into that and really like it. And suddenly these big distances that they travel are very much reduced. So I'm, I'm not convinced that there are cultural factors. I think there are cultural factors that politicians have in their heads that stop them doing kind of thing, things that people like me suggest, if I could put it that way. You know, that I think there are ways of, of um, not trying out different things. But I, I do genuinely think that if you give, whatever we call it, citizens, residents, children, older people, real transport choices in a high quality transport environment where, where it is choice rich, Again, what, what's culture? Uh, I worked in Germany for three years and all my colleagues really liked cars and I didn't like that, I wasn't happy. But where I lived in the city of Bochum, uh, when I want, wanted to go to my office, I had a bus, I had a tram, I had a, a cycle path and I had a railway station and I had a car. And it, to me, for, for, as a Brit working in that environment, it was astonishing. And all my colleagues, uh, who really liked Porsche and BMW and all this kind of thing, uh, used to tell me, it, it is stupid to drive your car into Dusseldorf, where our office was based. It is stupid. Why would anybody want to drive? So where's the culture in that? It's a car, uh, it's a car fetish country, um, which values lots of alternatives to the car. So I'm sceptical, uh, but if there's any, anyone's got any evidence, what is the Swedish culture? There was a culture of bicycle use in cities, and, it, and with increasing wealth, I guess it's, it's being reversed. So you can see that you know, the, the cultural factor is perhaps not as strong as some of the other factors. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I actually discussed this uh, when I worked on a, 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 an SEI project in Beijing some years ago with the Chinese governmental persons and they'd made a decision to widen the roads, delete the cycle paths and, and, and feeding this growth, the growth in, motor, in, in traffic was so great that people formed the view that it was very dangerous to cycle and they couldn't cross roads. So you, you're quite right to raise the, um, the Chinese example, uh, but the view I, that was put to me in Beijing was that this was objectionable and the Chinese government had set out uh, on a path to do with economic development and lots of uh, uh, societal objectives in that direction, which meant exterminating. They needed the space to get rid of the bikes. They needed the space for the, for the cars. And if you read the um, transport literature in North America, it's very interesting that in the 1920s and 30s, uh, General Motors and tyre manufacturers bought the urban rail and tram systems, in, in, especially in Californian cities, but throughout the United States, and shut them down. And then said, oh, there's been a decline in the use of public transport. You know, so it, the story is always, you know, the, one of the, the really exciting things about transport is there's a story within a story, you know, which is again why I'm a bit sceptical of culture, because there are usually fiscal things, uh, governmental policy things, there's all sorts of things. In Germany, people travel a lot by car because when they fill in their annual tax return and say, I have driven 65 kilometres each way to my place of work, they fill that in a box and they get a tax rebate. And my colleagues in Germany have worked for years and failed to delete the idea that you get a tax rebate to reward you maximising your travel by car to work. I mean, that it does not conform with any concept or any definition of sustainability. Why should somebody be rewarded to go to work by car? Thanks, John. I, I, can I just challenge you just uh, on the on this point? Sorry, yeah, it's on, on this point about yeah. 
about um, culture. Perhaps I put it in terms of thinking of cars as status symbols, yes, okay. something that isn't just about getting from A to B, yes, yes. Um, which, which undoubtedly they are both in developed and from the questions I'm getting seeing online in developing countries. Um, and if that is the case, that somehow there is something to do with how we show how much uh, our status through that. There's also a question around, you're talking about needing to have more denser cities with greater yeah. choice and easier access to services over a shorter yeah. distance. Yeah. You're actually asking people to value other things than, yes. let's yeah. say, a car. Um, yeah. you, you know, you, you are actually saying something about culture. Yeah. So it must lie there somewhere. Culture yeah. must come yeah. into it. You know, instead of having the status of owning a Porsche, it's the status of living in Sweden on Sade Malm or somewhere else where you've got easy access to a whole range of ser services and choice. Yeah. Um, since 2004, every year we've seen a decline in passenger kilometres of car use in cities in Europe, Australia and North America. And we're all having a big worry. Uh, why? Why? And there's been some detailed analysis in Britain on this. And the reason is that young people at the age of 17 are now deciding that they like their iPads and their tablets and they like the, all the associations, all the uh, characteristics of city living without a car uh, much more than at any time in the past. Mobile communications, uh, all the attributes, if you like, of city living. So this wouldn't deal with a rural situation. And, and in a way, we had a cultural predisposition when I was growing up and when my children were getting to that age. All the 17-year-olds waited for their first car. And the, this was absolutely the norm, and certainly in the United States was the norm, getting your driving license and getting your car. Absolutely critical. That has gone. Uh, th this is detailed survey work with, with these with people aged 17, 18, 19 and 20. And they say, why, why would we want a car? You know, we like living in the city, mobile communications, we like the electronics. So there's been a cultural shift. So even if there is such a thing as cultural predisposition and cultural, uh, what shall we say, cultural identity, uh, it's, it's far more susceptible to shifting than I think that we've ever appreciated in the past. I'm sure there still are cultural things, but we need to be aware of the change factor. Thank you very much, uh, John. I think we're going to wrap up on that quite hopeful note um, about the, the opportunities for, for change uh, and uh, you know, leveraging young people's uh, sort of wish actually to not to buy a car, not to be uh, brought into that sy system. But the things I took away very much from a talk that's very difficult to, to <laughs> summarise in any way was, was the point about needing to address a systemic change to think about uh, transport really as being just one thing that gets you a service rather than being something that you need to maximise and increase all the time. Um, and uh, we're very grateful that you were able to come. So uh, a round of applause for, for John, please. Thank you.